us. So we have um, a panel um, which we titled War in Ukraine, Perspectives from Scholars on the Ground. So we have with us um, a group of scholars who um, work at the Kyiv School of Economics and who are now in, in Kyiv and Ukraine, uh, who joined us for an hour to talk about uh, both the experience and also the analysis of the situation, the research. Um, so I, sorry, somebody speaking. Um, if you guys are in the audience, please mute yourself. Um, so um, I, I'm a Professor Oksana Shevel. I teach at the Tufts Political Science Department, so this event is co-sponsored by Political Science and IR. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it to our panelists. So I'm going to, uh, each panelist, when they speak, they will introduce themselves briefly so we don't waste time for the introduction. And maybe I'll just pose an opening question uh, to all of you, um, since, you know, many of us Tufts are not familiar with the Kiev School of Economics. Maybe you can just say a few words what your institution is, what it does what your own research is about um, and how you are adjusting with your work and your research uh, to the current situation. So we can go um, in, I guess, any order. Maybe, Timothy, I don't know if you want to start. Um, Melissa mentioned something about... Uh, maybe I'll ask Timothy Milovanov to start because okay. he's basically the head of the school and he can you know, also say about our institution uh, some words. Okay, that would be great. Yeah, okay, Timothy, Thank if you, you. want to... All right, so I'm Timothy Milovanov, I'm president of the Kyiv School of Economics. Uh, I also served as the Minister of Economic uh, Development, International Trade and uh, um, Agriculture uh, in the first government of Zelensky. I served on the, before that, in the Poroshenko, I served on the National Bank Council as deputy chairman. Uh, I'm on faculty at the University of Pitt, but uh, my real home is uh, Kyiv School of Economics and we, it's our uh, uh, top or top three university in economics it's top one in Ukraine. Uh, it has international faculty diplomas and uh, people who are publishing in top journals in the world. Uh, and uh, you know we have been developing it and uh, we have been lucky we have been able to execute uh, security protocols uh, and to relocate uh, a lot of people out of danger. Almost all students are accounted for. We're missing several, and we're looking for them. And you know, it's been long enough that they could be. You know, we'll see how it is because some of them were in these areas in northwest of Kiev, which were really, really badly shelled, or some of them have been destroyed completely. So, but uh, we only have out of four hundred students, maybe four unaccounted for and most of almost all of our stuff is accounted for um, and that's where we are and um, yeah back to you okay um yeah you want to say a little bit like what yeah, school does right how you're adjusting in your own research okay so uh yeah i'll, I'll just jump in so um uh there are several um you know several important individuals in our school, in our hierarchy. We have, you know, heads of the departments. These people, they monitor the situation with students and uh, with uh, policy researchers. Uh, so, um, so basically the whole work now is stopped. We, we do not conduct our scientific research and we do not conduct our regular teaching. Most of the stuff now is, um, trans well, is, is channeled to, to execute other tasks. So we, we consult uh, to the government, we consult to our diplomats, and we also participate in our individual volunteering projects. Everyone is busy now, everyone does you know, what they can do for the community. A lot of our students uh, volunteers as well. We know that some part of our staff, I mean, my co-authors are actually fighting now in territorial defense every night. And uh, some of our students, uh, alumni as well, so, uh, you know, we try to be in touch with them and, and support them. Uh, so the school is operational in a sense that we all work online from different spots. Uh, we check on each other and we, as I just said, we, we do some consultancy uh, and uh, analytical projects. Uh, currently, I'm responsible uh, for uh, some new streams of work, you know, for us. Solidarity is important. Um, Cultural diplomacy is important. That is why we're trying to participate in panels like yours. So we collect all the information about such panels and we try to enter and be there. Sometimes we are invited. Sometimes we have to force <laughs> ourselves. And, you know, uh, our Western partners are very polite and kind. They don't call us because they think that we are busy or we are too stressed. But, you know, 
this is our mission now we have to talk we have to provide our voices so regardless how stressed we are we we, we will do that and we also run a series of uh, guest lectures we try to invite you know leading intellectuals to give online um lectures to us uh, online on zoom but we they they talk to the ukrainian audience so uh, we already invited people like um, christakis from yale he's a famous sociologist we we had michael mcfall we had general petraus uh, next monday we will have paul krugman so we try to invite these you know strong uh, intellectuals to to show the solidarity and we have a huge team of people who are working now only on fundraising yeah we try to not with we don't try we do it we have this fundraising uh, activities uh, our school have uh, a special foundation which is registered in the united states and you can donate to humanitarian aid using this uh, foundation so basically you can send money in dollars euro crypto and because it is registered in the us you can expect all the tax uh, deductions, you know, and that everything. Would you be able to maybe to send um, an address of this in the chat, or send it to me later, and I can, you know? Um... I will. I will do so. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I just one day before the war, I submitted my before this invasion, <laughs> this specific invasion. The war has been for many years. So one night before the invasion, I submitted my paper and I wrote to my co-author that well, I should we should submit it before Putin invades and I also told him that now peer review and it's it is his problem I <laughs> I'll be busy with something else so um, yeah my regular research is usually about religion sociology of religion occupational mobility uh, identities uh, policy research so I'll, I'll pass and, and actually I think I robbed some of my colleagues uh, I, I talked a lot uh, so maybe we can switch to to some other questions because I described what we do. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I was actually wanted to ask that now that you mentioned your research, it would be really interesting, I think, to hear, given um, you know that what what is reported in Western media, you know, what people know and what people may not know, the, the important implications or findings of your research, uh, in particular, right, or maybe information that you know more generally for better understanding of the conflict. So, for example, you know, you, you obviously have, as you said, you know, from your own sociological research. Research. I remember you posted uh, at Ponars, I think, recently how decentralization reform actually helps this local resistance, which kind of didn't even occur to me, but of course it makes a lot of sense. So if you want to, you know, I will, we'll move to you as a colleague, but if you maybe all could say a little bit something that I guess my general question would be something that is not prominent in Western media that people may not know, but you think is important to know, and maybe these are some of the also related to the research that you do. So I don't know um, if uh, as Natalia or Anna or uh, Oleg want to speak about that. Well, well, my um, I might add uh, or contribute to that because I mean that decentralization stuff and all this they certainly they contribute to to the to the overall success of of this uh, of this war against Russia. Well, um, in terms of research and contribution uh, to the current discussion, um, well, in my capacity, for instance, um, um, the very important component. Uh, can you hear me well? It looks like yeah okay. So it I mean one of the key one of the key things that you know uh, this this war can have repercussions across the world is the uh, food security global food security right and uh, you know I mean this this uh, topic has been uh, circulated quite heavily at the moment because various um, think tanks across the world pick up this topic and you know try to uh, to show the implications. Um, uh, stronger and stronger. Uh, well, we did it, we did this analysis. Uh, I mean, already kind of uh, a month ago, before the war actually started, and we were focusing on this topic quite quite uh, quite heavily, uh, saying that look, guys, I mean, this is this is really serious. I mean, if 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 this is gonna happen, this is gonna ripple uh, across the globe, and especially in the low income countries, because I mean, if you if you look at the um, how. The contribution of Ukraine and, and Russia, plus Russia, because that's also concerns them quite heavily. I mean, the contribution is quite heavy uh, and quite important for the, for the global food security. 
uh, and it looks like this scenario is um, sort of uh, realizing because what we observe right now, uh, exports of uh, grain, which is key commodity, key food commodity across the world is not happening and the ports are really terminating the activities. What's going on with the spring field, field works? It's not also clear because you know fights over there and security is really low. Um, and then, and, you know, we have winter crops that were planted uh, in, in, in autumn, but they need to be fertilized right now. Uh, just today, uh, because if you don't do it right now, you don't have uh, you, you, the yields will be really reduced. And uh, in terms of the uh, Russia's capacity, they will not, they will, they won't be also able to export their grain. Look, look, look what's happening with their oils. Okay, so I mean, there was a case I think a couple of days ago that Shell was. Uh, was trying to buy oil and then what happened to their capitalization so they lost a lot because of the kind of um, so the the what's coming out of, of Russia is really toxic and uh, and in terms of the future or uh, um, you know the production um, outlook of uh, key commodities from this from this region from the Black Sea region it's it's really pessimistic so it looks like uh, that there's going to be no exports from this from this region for a couple of years to come. Uh, and this is really serious because in that case, the world uh, will be missing overall about 60 million tons of, uh, of grains. Uh, what percent, week, I mean, there are percent week, circulated. Do you know like off the top of your head, what percent of the global like grain, corn and so forth that Ukraine pr produces? That is now yeah, I mean, if, if, we, if we take together Russia and Ukraine, that's, um, um that's um that's close to the that's close to uh 30 percent of the global trade okay it's not kind of global production but global trade which is which is quite a lot uh substantial amount of time uh, uh, amount of grain and this is really related to the countries i mean for 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 the western countries that's that's going to be you know painful but it's bearable okay so uh europe and uh, and other countries can can cope with that but what's what's really be a problem is really uh, middle east northern africa uh, and you know some observers are telling us that's going to be kind of hunger um the riots uh, and you know we're gonna have really problems over there because i mean the the the, the threats of hunger and malnutrition and uh, you know increased poverty this is this is really what's uh, what's going to happen at least if this uh, madness that's happening right now in ukraine the, does not stop uh, soon okay uh, so uh, and this is this is kind of research we are doing right now uh, for various uh, for, in in various sectors and various uh, for various um, issues that we have right now also, um, this, this is what comes in terms of uh, research and kind of um, uh, hot analytics because, you know, <laughs> we are not able to do um, standard research, okay, so we do it really fast, <laughs> we, we compile up what's available and, you know, some hits uh, and hints and through that we are trying to, you know, collect what is possible, but still we are trying in this difficult time to uh, streamline a little bit our educational activities. Uh, Timothy uh, mentioned that, you know, the series of lectures uh, with uh, top intellectuals in the world, what we are trying to do is, is just to offer a little bit of education for our students and for all that could be interesting. So we understand that uh, education as normal uh, as it was before the war is not possible because, you know, some people left the country, some people uh, uh, are fighting uh, right now. So it's a really heterogeneous uh, crowd of people that is not possible to put together right now. I and mean, it's simply not possible. So there should be other ways to, uh, uh, you know, to, to mobilize people and to allow them to, you know, to get out of this environment, of this stressful in environment, uh, environment right now. Because, I mean, if you look how people in Ukraine behave, I mean, they just wake up and, First they do, they check the news. Okay, what, what happened over the night? I mean, were there really casualties or kind of fights uh, across uh, near, near Kyiv or other cities? And this is really stressful. So one way to, to get people out of that is just to, you know, step by step uh, to offer them 
you know you can you can listen this lecture you can try out this course those that are able to do that because i mean <laughs> even for us i mean for me this is really difficult i mean i check the news every <laughs> every minute <laughs> every five minutes it's not possible to get out of that uh, so that's it from my side for for, for the time being I will maybe help to moderate because I more or less uh, well, I'm aware of more what my colleagues are doing and our colleague Anna she has been um, doing some research in security and prior to that she studied capacities of and motivation of territorial defense forces so Anna maybe you can you know jump in and say a few words about that yeah hi everyone so a bit background to what I'm doing so for the past 10 years I've been part of security and defense uh, policies and worked uh, five years in Estonia International Center for Defense Security before that in Czech Republic and in Ukraine uh, with Estonia we've been launching um, this uh, policy project and capacity building project to integrate this comprehensive approach to security and defense uh, and, and the uh, idea of territorial defense and bigger engagement of civilian population in security and defense sector in Ukraine. After that, yes, since 2019, I've joined technologies and novel technologies work uh, really closely with companies that work with artificial intelligence and, and, and uh, technologies. So I have both backgrounds on tech industry and tech industry have mobilized to pretty uh, well in Ukraine uh, to help Ukrainian government and support in countering cybersecurity threats and information security threats. So I would say on direction of uh, infospace, Ukraine is already uh, have stepped forward in comparison to 2014 and already acting in offensive. Um, speaking on the land and how we are securing and protecting our land, uh, since to, uh, like recently, Ukraine finally introduced uh, legislation on territorial defense, so now it's all legalized. And um, uh, I think for the since invasion, 100k of civilians uh, joined territorial defense. What it gives and provides um, the legal uh, grounds for civilians actually to support uh, uh, defense forces and security forces. What we lack now is a uh, secure uh, sky. Uh, that's our kind of uh, weak point where international uh, cooperation and support is highly needed. Um, so, I mean, if you have questions on information security, cybersecurity, and also understanding how resilience is built, and resilience, it's meaning this. Uh, Distribu distributed uh, responsibility for security and defense. It's when we engage heavily uh, civilian population in such um, organizations as territorial defense, as well in, in cyber uh, direction. This uh, uh, formats of how IT army has been organized in Ukraine and that Ukraine is finally joining as a contributing partner to um, cyber um, Security Center of Excellence in Tallinn. It's NATO's uh, Center of Excellence on Cybersecurity. It also means that Ukraine is finally has been is a knowledge provider on um, different spectrums of hybrid warfare. So eventually, I think the agency of Ukraine is becoming more and more powerful. And for the past 14 days of war, we've shown how we are capable of securing our territory, capable of unifying the whole population, capable of even going on offensive in cyber information, yet we still lack uh, uh, capabilities to secure our sky. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Could I ask you just as a follow up? I mean, I think one of the things that was reported earlier, you know, before the invasion is how like cyber warfare from Russia would be great danger. And it seems like, again, I'm not an expert, but it seems like to me that they haven't, not that they haven't done anything, but they haven't done as well as maybe, you know, many fear. Like, is that, would you say, is that accurate? Like, is um, Russia maybe not quite as, you know, capable or not as able, um, was, was prevented from uh, causing the kind of disruption many feared? Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think exactly you're right. 
So um, Russia's uh, like hybrid operations, they were always built in several dimensions. So information operations coupled in parallel with cybersecurity attacks, and then the kinetic forces are coming afterwards. So they're preparing population by information warfare, preparing that population will be destructed and potentially receive well kinetic forces, right? By cybersecurity attacks, they're reinforcing information operation, attacking, for example, uh, websites, for defacement of uh, websites with some messaging that may also uh, destabilize uh, uh, society. And then the cyber attacks also um, uh, destroy critical infrastructure. Uh, when we've been tracking down uh, the activities in cyberspace before the invasion and as a task force under a hybrid task force and it gives school for economics we've started working like a lot from december in in january there were some uh, cyber attacks um what i would say that they were mostly uh, for portraying that they're active in cyberspace uh yet uh, and and also that uh, they've targeted some in critical infrastructure but after they started conducting kinetic um, operations, they lost their focus and uh, uh, Ukrainian IT specialists, they well organized and self-organization of Ukrainian uh, business uh, communities and government are really now more organized than in 2014. So they could already create a counter attacks. So uh, counter attacks and then offensive. Why cyberspace is really interesting in, in today's reality, because I would call it like a world web uh, war, <laughs> three W's, because as international organizations, Anonymous already uh, uh, entered this warfare, cyber warfare. So it, uh, it's, it, it is already across the Ukrainian borders in, uh, in cyber and internet space. What it means that we have now today, like you know, two divisions, Russian cyberspace and internet space and the West and those organizations that are supporting Ukrainian IT army um, as again, uh, highlighting Ukraine is fighting, not just simply defending its territory and independent sovereignty, but Ukraine is fighting uh, to protect uh, democratic values and the freedom of choice. That's why this appeals a lot to other anonymous cyber um, organizations that uh, decided to support this uh, counterattacks, and also looking from a perspective like one year ago uh, when we were tracking down cyber uh, offensives uh, by Russia, the targets are various. So colonial pipeline in US and uh, information uh, campaigns they target they target not only Ukrainian audience but uh, West audience as well. But uh, I do confirm that I think. Uh, Russia uh, kind of limited this unified front on their side to create more <laughs> um, cyber attacks on our infrastructure because on our side there are just not like the IT <laughs> army is quite big and supported by international partners. Thank you very much. Um, I, since I got knocked out uh, of the Zoom twice, I'm not sure if Natalia Shapoval had a chance to speak. No, um, maybe we can uh, ask Natalia. I'm not sure what question would be most appropriate, but if Natalia, you want to share something with us, um, you know, on your own, like at the end, either your perspective or, or some impl implications of your research or what you think is important for the audience to know, and then we'll uh, continue. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting. I'm ahead of uh, think tank at KSC. Uh, so our TV presented what's going on in school. Uh, our team is uh, also in safety right now. Uh, several of, uh, people joined military forces. Uh, most of people stay in Ukraine and we continue doing what we can do with uh, analysis. Mostly we work right now on uh, sanctions and um, uh, calculation of uh, damages for Ukrainian economy. Um, yeah, so uh, what we see from sanctions is that uh, unfortunately it, uh, uh, the the power which is not sufficient to stop uh, killing, uh, although probably uh, the toolkit to fight for other countries uh, against uh, Putin are very limited. So it's either military support uh, or uh, sanctions. 
and uh, in this regard it still remains a very important instrument and unfortunately many people have to suffer because of that economically in other countries and we are grateful that they do and for all the support. Um, thank you. Oh, that will be a short uh, uh, introduction. I'm grateful that you are thinking about what's going on in Ukraine and uh, show us uh, support. Thank you very much, Natalia. Maybe I'll just pose one more question to all of you and then we can uh, take you know, questions also from participants. Um, it's a very broad question, but I wanted to ask you, how do you think this will all end? For Ukraine as well as for Russia, because I think you know again, I at this point I'll be honest. I think I'm still somewhat in the minority among you know observers in the West, but I honestly don't see Putin winning this anyway in, in any shape, or even Russia surviving kind of you know with uh, its own system intact. Uh, but uh, I think at this point most uh, people here would say that that's overly optimistic perspective. Um, so I wonder, like, if you would share your thoughts, you know, what, how do you think the conflict would end? What's at the end of it for Ukraine, for Russia, and maybe some things, sort of some reasons why you would think that, that perhaps, again, may not be in the mainstream media in the West at this point. And it's, like, open to anybody who wants to take it on. Uh, Timothy Milovanov, um, are you here? Are you with us? Uh, I'm with us. I'm, uh, okay. frankly, multitasking. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, we're, we have to multitask now, but uh, the question was about uh, and the end game of Putin, you know, can he win? Will we win? Um, is it too optimistic to assume that Ukraine is going to win? Can you just broadly comment on these things? Is it optimistic to assume that? So Oksana is an optimist. She believes that Putin cannot win it anymore, uh, but... What, what's so, your perspective? I think there are two possible scenarios. How, how would it end, you think, and why? That's basically, I guess, would be the question. So I think there are two possible scenarios. One is, um, you know, at some point, all wars end. Um, and um, the question is when, you know, is it just an episode and there'll be a further war? you know, five or 10 years ago, because uh, further, because we already had 2014, right? Um, with Crimea annexation and the east of Ukraine, right? So um, will we be able to resolve the situation in some way now that it is definite? So that's, I think, one question. So are we talking about an episode, ending of an episode? Or are we talking about resolving the issue? There's a fundamental issue that the pattern of Russia behavior is uh, not specific to Ukraine. Um, of course, they want to get rid of Ukraine as a nation, at least it, uh, given what they are doing to civilian population is really, really nasty. Um, but, you know, it's uh, war number five for Putin. The first one being, I think, Chechnya, then there's Georgia in 2008, then there is uh, Crimea and the east of Ukraine, and then there is Syria. And presumably he thinks that he has won these wars. And if it's gonna be just another war that he can claim victory, then we will expect more escalation in the future. So, you know, one way to end, and I think if politicians and diplomats and uh, people around the world will make that decision, you know, in my view, mistake, they'll freeze the conflict and we'll just have another round to go you know, several years from now, it could be further Ukraine, or it could be Baltics, or it could be Poland, it could be whatever. So another way to earn uh, to end it, if something happens in in Russia, either uh, destabilization economic that it makes uh, Russia very weak, or you know there is a coup, or there is some pressure on Putin domestically, or the other political elites which are still there in some ways uh, start seriously thinking about their survival. So that's the second way. The third way, there'll be some kind of, uh, you know, West Berlin story that uh, there'll be a wall, essentially part of Ukraine, which is controlled by Ukraine. And, you know, maybe some of the, you know, more territory less that has to be decided. And then Ukraine will be arming itself and it will be, it's going to be cold war afterwards, you know, essentially Russia will be isolated until it, uh, it collapses in, in one way or another. So that's, I think, the third scenario. So to sum up, I think there's one scenario, very, very simplistic, but one scenario, we're gonna freeze this conflict, the world is gonna freeze this conflict, and then it will just continue further later at a higher scale, because every time there is an escalation, 
you know, we see there's just degrees of magnitude and escalation. The other one is something, you know, soon or not so soon happens to domestic politics and Putin. And there is, or the third one that um, either Ukrainian, you know, troops push back in some way, or, you know, there's enough pressure to have some kind of uh, security of territorial integrity and then some borders. And after that, there'll be a cold war and Russia will be squeezed uh, to, you know, through economic uh, and not only economic, political and even military pressure. Do you think any of these scenarios is more likely? I guess like with what, what I would maybe ask kind of to further on that question, what kind of settlement, if any, because now there are reports in the press, right, that, I mean, you know, negotiations are going, they haven't produced much results, right? But Putin's demands, as you said, um, you know, essentially the so-called demilitarization, denazification of Ukraine, that's erasure of Ukrainian statehood, right? Like what could potentially the settlement look like, um, you know, if there is a settlement? If there is a settlement, there should be a, an attempt or there will be an attempt by all, all sides to sell the victory to their audiences. So Putin will try to sell the victory that, listen, we demilitarized uh, Ukraine. There's some kind of neutrality or something like that. You know, uh, the West, uh, the EU and uh, the US and the rest will sell it uh, to their audience and see we have solved the problem. And now we're going to be building, you know, Ukraine as a part of, you know, you know, going to be developing it. And then domestically in Ukraine, it will have to be uh, explained that we won in some way. Okay. And um, so that's a really difficult um, set of conditions to achieve. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm less concerned about Russia, actually, because the propaganda there allows to uh, declare everything a victory. Uh, the real constraint, I think, and the West and Russia has made, you know, they have made this mistake so many times in Ukraine, that they underestimate the importance of the agency, of the sovereignty of Ukrainian public. I have seen that mistake made again and again. And even in thinking, you know, about how to resolve, uh, I think Minsk II and Minsk I is one example. Uh, where just uh, politicians sign something and then Ukrainians wouldn't agree with that. And constitution, you might not remember, you might remember that when there were constitutional changes proposed to be changed, there were protests to the extent that there were grenades, you know, downtown Kiev, people were blowing up and someone died. Uh, so many protests were against that. Then uh, you might remember that in 2013, 2014, the European foreign ministers, three countries, Poland, I think, Germany and France, tried to negotiate a deal with Yanukovych. And they negotiated between Yanukovych, the previous president who was ousted, and um, the leaders of protests. And then they left and they said, you know, they just, um, they, it's a deal. And then um, the guys went, the leaders of protest uh, movement went to the Maidan, to the protesters and announced the deal and they were booed. And uh, the deal was not, you know, was not sustainable or feasible in any way. And so then, you know, several years later, I talked to some of uh, high and pretty high level diplomat and, you know, really as high as it gets in Europe and said, we just made a mistake. We should have talked to the leaders of protesters more, you know. And I think they, they didn't get the point that it's people didn't want to have a deal with Yanukovych. People wanted Yanukovych out. So I think any kind of structure which will, uh, which will look like we are moving to the Cold War West Berlin kind of story, but fundamentally um, is not giving Ukrainians the agency they are looking for, the sovereignty, will be a freezing of the conflict in disguise with another episode coming soon uh, of a much worse proportions. So in the end of the day, I think the story is, you know, if I don't talk about how it's going to end in the next several weeks or several months or several years, but I'm going to talk about how it's going to end in two decades or in one decade, we know now that Russia and nuclear weapons is not a sustainable combination. Everyone understands it. So Russia actually has to be denuclearized in the next decade or two. And that means putting so much pressure on the economy that they will end up in a situation like Ukraine in 1990s, where they needed money so badly, they needed funds so badly that they were willing to give up 
nuclear weapons. And I think that will be the attempt to exercise strategy. Now, some people are saying that maybe China is a pivotal player, and they are in many ways, and they stand to benefit in the, you know, they stand to be, I, I was saying that they stand to benefit from the conflict, because, you know, if China right now weighs one way or another, that will matter quite a bit, you know, if China, let's say, goes and says, Russia, stop it, you know, then essentially Russia is out of options economically, and not only economically. Uh, but many people say that, you know, it's good for China because China is now going to have all the bargaining power, all the chips, you know, to, to decide the fate of the conflict in some way. However, there is also a fundamental issue that China, whatever we think, is not really aligned with Russia in the long run. Because the power of China is coming from the economy and the power of the US and the power of the EU and of Canada, of every country, which is a superpower right now in the world, is coming from the economy except for Russia. Russia has not got the economy to be a superpower. It has got only military, and it's not clear how good that military is. At this point, they only have gotten brutality. All right? So, and Russia, to be a superpower, to be in the league of the countries, in the longer run, not in, you know, not by turning the table over all the time, but really to be a player, they have to become an economic superpower. So fundamentally, they need access to the Baltic Sea and to the Black Sea, and even better to Bosphorus, to the Mediterranean Sea, because otherwise they cannot be independent economic superpower. But to achieve that, they need to control these countries. So that's what they are fighting for, but they haven't got the economy. And in the process of fighting, that's going to damage the economy, global economy. And China is not going to like that either. Because China is going to have problems with logistics, with demand, with supply chains. So fundamentally, China is not going to be aligned with Russia in this over the next 10 years conflict or something like that. So however this war is going to end right now, we are up for uh, some form of disarmament of Russia in the next decade or two through economic means. And we will still, we will yet to see, but I, I'm pretty confident we will see the US, the EU and China cooperating on this. Oksana, you're muted. Oh, oh, sorry, I was saying thank you, Timothy. That was a really fascinating set of things to think about. Um, I think this denuclearization of Russia, I don't think anybody had even contemplated this, at least as far as I know, but uh, that's certainly fascinating. Would anybody else like to comment on sort of like their, um, you know, either possibility for a settlement, what would it look like, like the red lines that say cannot be crossed, um, or, you know, what's the future likely to bring um, in your analysis? I don't think we can comment more than we can. We can. I think Timothy, Timothy did or, it. Or, or, or Anna wanted to say something. Sorry, okay. Anna. Yeah. 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 Look, um, since 2011, uh, I've been part of the Baltic conversation on in Russia. And it was a time before um, the Crimea, uh, annexation of Crimea, and before the war in, East, in Eastern Ukraine. And um, and when Baltics would be speaking to Western allies, NATO, that Russia is building up and uh, we have to be cautious, they were not heard. When uh, Russia annexed Crimea, again, Poland and the Baltics were telling to Western allies, this is not good. This, uh, I mean, I'm talking about uh, red lines because all red lines have been crossed. And, and, and today's, uh, reality how the western academia and western th think tanks have been rationalizing russia's acts how russia acts i think it should be stopped and uh, start to rationalize how ukrainians are responding to the security threats and how eastern flank of nato is seen in russia and i think when we will turn that uh, from that angle and start looking from rationalizing how we can build and how we can review the international security paradigm and how we can manage and cre create the security, meaning that Russia is going to go nuts a bit uh, this time. There is no rationalization. Um, there is no good path for Russia unless Russia changes itself. And who has to change Russia itself? It's Russian population. We, of course, can always try to push them by economic sanctions, by more isolation, 
Unfortunately, we cannot impose any alternative government in Russia. What we can do now today is to understand that Ukrainian population, it's uh, it's not like a uh, population in other former Soviet states. It has um, always took arms in it uh, and, and went to the streets. So there is, there, is, there won't be any easy talks uh, with Ukrainian population today, because when we see what's happening, barbaric acts of violence in Mariupol and direct bombing, bombings and shellings, I don't see there's uh, any option that Russia would claim a victory over, this, over the city because it would be a humanitarian and we would lose a trust in our uh, population and citizens in those cities. So I don't, I don't see this option, but let's say, of course, we can frozen those territories, we can freeze this conflict for some, for, for some time to come. And unfortunately, Western allies, sometimes they give, they help, but really like um, lagging behind. So the help that we, and assistance that we are receiving today, we should have received in 2014. And unfortunately, what we may see today is that it would take five to eight years for the West to realize that Russia would go further, and the next ones, of course, uh, uh, are Poland and Baltic Baltic states. And I think Poland and Baltic states, they really, really, truly understand that. But it is important that Poland and Baltic states would not be taking all assistance provided from the uh, nation states. What I mean is that all assistance, for example, given planes, would have to come from a uh, unified voice of Western allies. And that not something, not the situation when some uh, Western countries would be hiding behind Poland providing planes, but when it would be happening from unified voice. And I think that unless it happens, Russia would be pushing further and further because they really want to, to show how uh, unity is not the case in the West. And anything, anytime that we freeze this conflict, it will erupt further. Thank you, Anna. I would just want to re-emphasize, I think you made two very important points. I totally agree with this. I think this Western kind of re being reactive rather than proactive. I mean, we've seen it so many times, right, from the weapon supply, like in Germany, right, like things had to get really bad before they do things that been asked to do earlier, right? And that's really unfortunate because now we have, you know, hundreds of Ukrainian civilians dying and how more would it take, right, before they figure out whichever way it is to get the planes to Ukraine, right? I mean, that's a thing, something that really frustrates a lot of people in Ukraine that the West still somehow, and I think that goes to your second point, that like legitimizing or creating any sort of like attempt, you know, for Russia to look like it actually has some claim to make, right? I think at this point, the only level, leverage they have is threatening war crimes. Like that's all the leverage they have left, right? So I think this sort of idea that Russia has to be given some kind of offer and some sort of like, that they're entitled to something, like I, I like I just don't that, don't see how that is a morally sustainable position, given you know what 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 the, what they're doing. But that brings me to the question, and maybe you know any of you, uh, you know, as Natalia or um, right, um, all I want to speak about it because there is a question, and it's related to what we're talking about in the chat about this Ukrainian neutrality and NATO, right? Like, would this be sort of a solution? Like, a, a, you know, of if Ukraine said, and you know, President Zelensky made some indications right that maybe ukraine will not pursue nato membership like i i mean i have five views on that but i'm gonna be quiet i see timothy wants to speak to that uh please go ahead and yeah all of you like whoever like maybe i think timothy raised his hand this, oh, um yeah, let's let's have timothy and then anna and then whoever else wants to jump in timothy yeah. milovanov please thank you uh so i think uh, first of all let's fix it that fundamentally nato is a red herring in uh, for Putin because no one has been offering any NATO membership to Ukraine that was not even in the works uh, in you know in whatever uh, reasonable manner you want to think about it furthermore if you look at sociology just support uh, was not all that high for NATO until 2014 and now of course on you know, 2022. So something else is, is, is happening. It's not really about neutrality. Ukraine has been neutral. So th that apart is that there is language being circulated. And that's a construct which is needed, I think, for Putin to declare some kind of victory in any case, because otherwise he has nothing to declare. He, he went out clearly trying to take Kiev and talk, topple, you know, trying to topple Zelensky's government. That's not happening. 
Kyiv is not going to be taken now. Even the most skeptical military analysts agree that, you know, no matter how many people will die, uh, Kyiv is not going to be taken. And, you know, there are simple arguments that, um, you know, Kyiv is bigger than Manhattan. And if you compare it with Leningrad, uh, Nazis had to keep their, you know, Kyiv is much bigger than Leningrad at that time, much ha has much better positions, many more roads. Um, it's not like Grozny is not in the middle of a valley where you can position uh, and uh, observe it through, you know, from the hills around it, just the opposite. It actually, the center is on the hills and you can defend it. So the geography is very different with the river and roads. And uh, it's also the urban sprawl. It's not that you have a clear belt. So if you want to build a belt, let's say two miles uh, wild or one, one kilometer wild, engineeringly, just if there were no resistance, you have to blow up a, build, a belt like that. It would take you half a year to do it. Um, just, you know, if, if it were an engineering exercise, you know, to build a highway around, uh, around Kiev, maybe a year. So, you know, so it's not possible to take Kiev with all the urban resistance and weapons and stuff. Uh, so he can declare that. He might be able to declare some cities, uh, but uh, so he needs an exit strategy. So I think a lot of this language is really about preparing an exit strategy. So what Putin has been doing, you know, in, in the beginning militarily, he has been adding options all the time, every day. And so right now, I think it starts, at least to me, this language starts suggesting that he starts building exit options for himself. And in many ways, it's a sign of, you know, it's a welcome development. But as we discussed before, it's not about NATO, it's not about neutrality, it's about finding a way to preserve sovereignty of uh, Ukraine and allowing Putin to sell something domestically. Or we're going to all out, you know, Ukraine versus Putin, and someone will have to stop existing. I think in the longer run, that's actually the real game or the real end game is about, it's either Ukraine or Putin. But in the shorter run, it could be that both uh, sides, you know, will keep uh, sovereignty and he will claim victory about some neutralization or something, you know, neutrality status. Uh, at least that's what they are trying to build up. Well, what is going to happen? It's an open question. I don't know. It's really too volatile to have any reasonable prediction at this point. Anna, do you want to add to it? You had you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think here are several points. First, for Russia, what's important is to uh, uh, reconfirm its vacuum, its uh, its own reality. So its own reality is quite binary. It's West versus Russia. So Ukraine being part of the West is always a failure for Russia. It's one thing. Whether it would be you, whether it would be NATO, whether it would be like you know Ukraine as independent and successful country, it would be uh, a lost game for Russia. So they would always, as an opportunistic, they're not strategy wise, but opportunistic wise, would always like reframe it. It's one side. From the other side, what Ukraine really needs, it's not NATO, it's not EU. It's about uh, values. We show them uh, and we see, for example, integration into markets, uh, uh, integration with those Western values and European Union, uh, as those integration and free trade agreement happened already, started happening many years ago. But the second point is security guarantees. Uh, and today, I mean, I, I think today is a really fundamental one because if uh, giving up our nuclear uh, capabilities, capacities uh, in uh, 10, like 25, 30 years ago, it meant nothing as a memorandum. So us joining NATO, would it mean something? I mean, here's a question, what, uh, which paradigm of if international security should we rebuild and how we look at it that it would provide some security guarantees it's okay okay let's be out outside of nato but which security guarantees ukraine would receive in terms of protected its sovereignty because unfortunately uh, uh, other um, frameworks they always fail to work uh, and let's look at league of nations that organization didn't pr provide the security uh, for states uh, before the Second World War. Let's look today at UN. Let's look today at other memorandums. Unfortunately, I think the fundamental thing here is uh, how to make Russia 
accountable for its acts on international level by international law. Thank you, Anna. Um, would other, any of the other panelists uh, like to comment on this? There is also a question about um, the uh, how likely or unlikely if anybody wants to weigh in on Putin deploying tactical nuclear weapons, especially if he's cornered, right? Like if there is no sort of face saving um, exit for him. Uh, I, that's if Anna, anybody has um, I'll, I'll have to go to a board of director meetings mm -hmm. of the Kiev School of Economics. I just want to just uh, thank you and then run away and of course pitch that guys please donate uh, and support yeah. academics and uh, it's really really important and also uh, sign all kinds of memoranda join programs dual degrees host our researchers you know we have to make sure that human capital uh, doesn't flee ukraine and is supported can be brought back to rebuild the country so that's really really critical because it's also a part of sovereignty intellectual sovereignty is a pillar of sovereignty uh, had we not had Kiev School of Economics, we probably would have been somewhat weaker uh, in terms of academic discussions at the very least and international discussions and sanctions building and so on and so forth. So, so I really ask you to be very, very uh, conscious about how you try to help um, the communities of scholars uh, so that you do not destroy destroy all that human capital in the process, because these are really communities. Host the communities and help them then restore, rebuild, and uh, uh, don't make them refugees, make them, you know, make them academics of the world. Uh, and we are, we are standing institutional to help with that and support us financially, support the people of Ukraine financially. And then, you know, it's a humanitarian issue. It's really not politics. You know, it's what Russia is doing is some kind of disease. It gets to people. It got to Nazis and you know to Germans with Nazis in in um, in the twentieth century. It was with Stalin in Holodomor and other atrocities he committed to his own. And Russia is known for committing atrocities to their own people. And what they are doing to their own people right now, they are you know slaughtering their military. And um, they are also kind of taking the soul out, the humanity out of the future generations for Russia. So there is really, really damaging. And it's a really fundamental public health issue when a country gets sick. So it's not just politics, it's not just economics. It's really something that we as humankind have to learn to prevent. So it doesn't get to that stage where humans, some humans, some individual humans press buttons they, and make orders to kill hundreds of, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of other humans, and everyone in the chain of command just executes it, as if it were an order, or I am a political, I'm staying out of it, you know, you can't stay out of it, you have to take a side, because it's about humanity, and it's a public health issue, it's threatening humanity as, as the species, so, you know, it's a big issue, we just forget it, and we need to make sure, we need to learn to prevent, it's like climate change. We have to learn so we survive as humankind. We have to learn to prevent that in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your solidarity and thank you for empathy. Thank you, Timothy. I really wish you all the best and definitely we'll, uh, we'll, we'll work on, you know, things. I mean, there is a lot of, already a lot of activities to help scholars in Ukraine and so forth. Maybe let me, we don't, we don't have, we don't have about six minutes left. One of the things that, you know, have been coming up um, in the chat, and I think it relates to points several of you made about um, how to deal with Russia, right? Including these sort of partnerships with various Russian institutions, right? Like scholars, there are a few brave people in Russia who protest despite, you know, the oppressive regime that is there. But unfortunately, for the most part, the society there um, is buying the propaganda. I mean, we, we hear this completely tragic stories, right? Of people, family members calling their family members in Russia that they're being bombed by Russian planes and they don't believe them. I mean, this is like mind boggling, right? So um, if you have some, I mean, we, for example, at Tufts, uh, one of our uh, schools had partnership with the Moscow Institute of International Affairs, the MGIMO. There is now pressure being put to severe this cooperation because, of course, you know, MGIMO is an arm of foreign ministry, endorses this uh, occupation. Um, but if you have some thoughts about, you know, kind of what kind of, if any partnership could continue with like treatment of Russia in academic circles. And uh, as Timothy is saying, I think establishing connections and supporting Ukrainian uh, in, in educational institutions is critically important. Um, so if, I don't know if you want to speak about that, any of you. Well, I can start, um, you know, I, I think we should address this elephant in the room that of course, as Ukrainian scholars, we can be biased and emotional. And I think it's important to say it 
out loud, you know, so we all uh, understand this. Nevertheless, I want to share my opinion. I actually have a very strong opinion that the Russian academic institutions should be sanctioned as strong as the Russian government and Russian business. Uh, I think it has been evident that Russian government has used soft power uh, to influence Ukraine and Western countries. So the Russian government has used religious organizations, academic organizations, and media to influence narratives which, which were con consumed by, by Western intellectuals and uh, diplomats. And, uh, you know, and now uh, the West is frozen and uh, sometimes uh, doesn't know what to do and how to react to Russia. So, of course, the pivotal issue, the, the crucial issue here is how to distinguish those, you know, brave individuals who stand against the regime. There are several points I want to, to make here. First, all institutions are guilty. Yeah, there is no, <laughs> the, the institutions are compliant. So uh, then you have to also understand that sometimes we romantize, uh, romanticize elites and intellectuals and scholars and journalists and uh, authors. In fact, as a sociologist, you know, I believe that it's not about whether you're scholar or not scholar, it's which social group you represent in, 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 in your society. Your scholars, they, they also watch TV. They also believe to propaganda. Um, even, you know, I have my good friends who are sociologists and they live in Russia and they called me uh, immediately. And you know what they asked me? They, they said, Timothy, we receive mixed messages. We don't know what is happening. On the one hand, there is information that you are bombed. On the other hand, there is information you are not. Would you be so kind to clarify? You know, they're very polite, they're very nice, but they are also trapped into this uh, regime and the regime has to be punished. And uh, so, so my, my personal belief is that sanctions, they must be strong on Russian academic institutions as well. And those brave individuals, if they want you know, to not to be compliant, they should self-organize, they should quit, they should run away, they should do whatever, but they should not be affiliated with, uh, with the regime. Um, and I also think that it is more imperative now to support Ukrainian researchers, you know, because Ukrainian scholars and researchers, they do not experience minor inconvenience. It's not about interrupting grants. It's not about inflation. It's not about they're not able to travel to conferences. It's about our co-authors and colleagues whose faculties were bombed, whose relatives died, and who are fighting now with Kalashnikovs, even though they have to submit papers. Uh, and I think these people should be prioritized whenever you decide uh, how to allocate your support. I just want to add uh, that recently, I think a couple of days ago, we prepared an open address from the school on this particular issue, on the academic collaboration and cooperation with Russian institutions and scholars. And uh, I think Timothy uh, you know, pointed it right, as we indicated in the letter that, you know, um, yeah, Russian institutions are guilty. So is this the one that you just shared in the chat? Yes, the yes, I just, okay. shared, I, just shared, I just shared the link with this address to all the world communities, academic communities. And okay, there, are four points, there are four points over there, so please just open up and just, uh, you know, read okay. it. And, yeah. I know we're out of time. I want to, if you would, if one of you could stay a couple of minutes, I see Professor Robinson has a question. Maybe we'll let her ask the last question. Uh, Professor Robinson, if you would unmute yeah. yourself. I can stay for longer. My colleagues might leave earlier. Okay. So, uh, and P Professor Robinson, you're muted. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Yes. So this has been fascinating. I just wanted to make one of these one suggestion, which I think would help the uh, American population to better understand the situation. What I have been fascinated by is the scholars raising issues that are not a part of the journalistic discourse that we hear every day, specifically uh, the, the, the discussion of global food security, uh, how to integrate the population into security and defense, 
uh, the discussion about cybersecurity, even this idea of denuclearization of Russia. I think that the way in which scholars could make a unique contribution to the glo global information and discussion of this issue is by creating some kind of a forum in which these people and these ideas can become a part of the global media discussion of the issue. Calling for partnerships and the things that everybody is talking about all the time, there are other people who are doing that. But today, what I have heard is people talking about issues and things that are happening that explain in, in large part why uh, Ukraine is still fighting, but they also introduce different ways of looking at international relations. So that's the comment I wanted to make. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you who made comments that have better educated me and have expanded uh, and deepened my way of understanding this conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are out of time. So if any of you would like to share any, you know, additional thoughts or comments or please do otherwise we will thank you greatly for your time and hope you stay safe and we'll talk to you soon again um thank you very much um i will just reiterate please donate we have shared our links and um i assume that most of the audiences here that you know you work in the universities uh, the research educational institutions probably some of you are deans or provosts or professors so we call for this action you know to support ukraine institutionally that what was my senior colleague Timofey Milovanov was saying so we are calling not you know we are calling for writing uh, memorandums of understanding with us as our president you know famously said we 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 don't need a right we need ammunition so you know the same can be applied for universities we don't need just um you know uh, solidarity and the opportunity to stay with you as uh, visiting scholars for three months we need long-term joint programs, laboratories, uh, PhD programs that we can launch in Ukraine or in you know, neighboring countries. So Ukrainian scholars, they feel like in, they're in community, they can build their human capital and they will be back to Ukraine to rebuild the society. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. And um, maybe my colleagues can also say something and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be going uh, to, to our business. Yeah, stand with the crate with ukraine with whatever you can that's uh i would say that yeah thank you so much for this opportunity and i hope we'll stay in touch and to exchange all our insights anytime thank you thank you very much really appreciate you taking time and please stay safe with you oh natalia yeah thank you